Okay guys, in this video we're going to talk about thermal expansion. This is quite a short uh, section of the course, um, but it has some really important questions that often come up uh, on the IGCSE, uh, particularly in the uh, multiple choice sections, you may well see this one. So, uh, these are the syllabus points, I'm not going to read them out, but you can pause the video if you want to see exactly what CIE want you to do. So again, a CIE definition is important for this one. We need to know that thermal expansion is a tendency of matter, that means stuff, physical stuff, to change volume, that's the amount of space it takes up, in response to a change in temperature through heat transfer. So here are a couple of examples of why we see, uh, of where we see this kind of thing. Um, so classic examples might be uh, if we build a railway line. If we build a railway line, you might not be able to see it terribly well in the diagram, um, but basically where I have one rail here and I put a second rail here, they always leave a gap between them. That's one example. Uh, the second one um, is the idea of a thermometer, and hopefully uh, in lesson we're going to try this. What you can do is get a round bottom flask, so just a, a big glass globe, and you can fill it up with liquid. So it'll look like this. And then we stick in the end um, a capillary tubing, which is a really thi thin, really thin, really thin, fine tube of glass. And what you'll see is that the liquid will shoot up the tube. Now, if you then heat that liquid, what we see is that the liquid starts to rise. That's basically how all thermometers work. I'm going to try and explain why that happens. Um, and the last one is the idea of hot air balloons. Hot air balloons are uh, really cool, um, and they relate a little bit um, to uh, density. So remember, we said density, which is that funny symbol rho, is mass divided by volume. And they also relate to floating and sinking. And we'll, not, and we'll probably talk about that a little bit later. So here's a classic uh, kind of exam question. They may tell you, here are some uh, transmission lines. So these are electricity cables. So they might be they might have a distance of, say, uh, two kilometers between them. And we look at them on a very, very cold day and a hot day. So this probably wouldn't work in Malaysia because we don't have that much difference in temperature. Uh, but in countries like the UK and Canada, um, where it can go from 30 degrees in the summer to minus 10, minus 15 degrees in winter, um, you may well see this. So on a hot day, they sag down and they droop. On a cold day, they're much tighter. So why might that be? Um, well... It all comes down to the idea of what's actually happening to the individual particles. So if we remember, inside here, whoops, we have solids. really wish you would stop doing that. So we have a solid. So when the particles are all cold, they all look like this, really close together, all touching, and they're barely moving. Now, what happens to particles when they get hot? As we've said a couple of times, they start to vibrate more. So they vibrate back and forth. Now, if they're starting to vibrate back and forth, what we get are gaps opening up between them. It's almost like if you imagine your two fists here are particles. On a cold day, they just kind of vibrate like this, barely doing anything. But as they get hotter, they start to vibrate off of each other. And because there's nowhere else for them to go, the only thing that they can do is collide off of each other and get further and further apart. And as they get further and further apart, um, they obviously take up more space. So in other words, if this started out as, two, as a two kilometer long piece of wire, when we make it really, really hot, because it's got longer, it might now be a 2.3 kilometer long piece of wire. And if it's 2.3 kilometers long, it's going to be extra length, so it's going to droop down. Um, so that's the basic idea of thermal expansion. That's what explains the railway lines. When the railway lines get really, really hot, they're going to expand, and that means that they would break and they would uh, sort of buckle against each other if they didn't have some space to expand into. So what happens is when they're hot, is they look like that. They expand into that gap. For liquids, as the liquid expands, again, same thing. Remember, this diagram is wrong 
because we should always draw liquids so that they're all touching. Um, but as they expand and move and collide more, um, they expand, uh, they take up more volume. And so the only way that they can take up that more volume, because liquids can flow, they go shooting up the tubes. They've got an advantage over solids in that. A solid has to stay in the same place. But liquids, although the particles want to, ex so the particles don't want to expand, the gaps between the particles want to expand. Um, but because the particles are free to move, they can escape up the top. For a, so for a hot air balloon, this is where it gets really interesting. If I have a hot gas, then the gas will move around faster, collide off itself more, and so it will expand. Now, if you remember, less dense mm -hmm. fluids always rise which is the basics of convection. So in a hot air balloon, what we do is we have such a huge amount of very, very low density gas, just because it's hot, that the hot air balloon becomes less dense than its surroundings, and it floats up. Um, and the really clever thing about that is you can do it just with heat, just because hot gas is less dense than cold gas. You could do it with helium instead, because helium itself is a less dense gas, um, but that's very, very expensive. You have to mine helium, um, and it's difficult to get hold of, and it escapes easily. Hot gases, all you have to do is burn some fuel, and you can heat the air around you. Uh, so that's why a hot air balloon works. Okay, so another little uh, bit of writing for you to have a go at. What I want you to try to do is, uh, here's somebody who's got a jam jar, and she's just taking it out and she can't open it. Here's a hint for you. As you open a lid, think about what happens. As you twist as you twist it, it comes up and away. In other words, uh, you, what ha in other words, you make the inside, if you imagine the hollow bit inside here, here's an area, yeah, this volume has to get bigger. The volume inside has to get larger as you try to open it. Now, think about what will happen to the pressure in that area if you make the volume larger. This might not be obvious, um, but have a go. Or you might just know the answer. Um, thinking about pressure, thinking about thermal stuff, can you explain what you would do? Okay, well, there's a really cool answer to this. Um, the, the reason that you often can't get this to open is because uh, the pressure outside will be l higher. So we have high pressure uh, and low pressure on the inside. So the pressure outside is higher than the pressure inside. So as you try to screw it open and let it lift, that air pressure from outside is pushing on the top of the lid and preventing it from opening. So what you can do is run the jar under hot water. If you run the jar under hot water, then what happens is the pressure, so if we increase the temperature, the pressure will go up. And then eventually, if the pressure inside goes up, it balances out the pressure outside. So it's easy to lift. You can twist it off easily because you don't have to overcome that force or that pressure pushing down because you've got an equal pressure pushing up on the jar and it just pops open. Try it next time. If you can't open some, if you can't open a jar, try running it under hot water. If there's a little air gap inside, that air will heat up and it'll open really easily. If you have any questions about that, uh, feel free to uh, either see me in lessons or send me a quick email and I will go through anything you might want to talk about. Thanks very much.